Yeah. Right? I, I, he's no, giving... No, no, no. He, he's giving her the look. <laughs> she, she's dead. It's over. It's over. Uh, Bassett Hound looks you in the eye. <laughs> We're good? Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here with Fireside Chat number 204? 203. 203. Uh, boy, I was so proud of myself. I was sure that after 200, I would really know, and I blew it already at 203. <laughs> anyway, this is my home. This is my chance to talk to you about what is on my mind. We have no, no notes. We have no teleprompter. It's completely spontaneous. And, of course, Otto is here. Snoopy is making a visit because he has fallen in love with my guest. <laughs> wow, he heard Snoopy and he came over to me. That is rare. Are we getting this on video? I'm not sure. In 203, people have seen me rub Snoopy. <laughs> Snoop. He's a little jealous of his brother. Anyway, this is a very, uh, this is truly one of the, the most important. Uh, I try to make every fireside chat important. But this, this, is, this is what I care about the most in life, and that is evil. So a few words before I introduce my guest today, and I don't have many guests on the fireside chat, as you folks know, other than Otto, I guess. <laughs> but he's not a guest, he's a host. Anyway, uh, since I was a child, I've been preoccupied with evil. I have no explanation. Everybody has a nature. Uh, it's something you come to realize, especially when you become a parent. You look at the child and go, they have, a, they have a nature. And we do. Whether God put it there or it's just there, it's there. So my nature has been a preoccupation with evil. I hate evil. What is evil? People deliberately hurt other people unjustly. It's not really complex. Whenever people ask me for a definition, I'm thinking, you really don't know what evil is? And the truth is, people don't know what it is. That's the irony, and I will, that's a big theme in my guests' thinking, writing, and speaking. And we'll get to that, obviously. But I do want to share with you a few insights on evil and then our dialogue. I have often uh, said, as long as I remember speaking, I have said this. People say that evil is dark, but that's not true. Evil is actually very bright. You can look at the dark, but you can't look at the very bright. Very few people stare at evil. They deny it. There's a very famous book called The Denial of Death, where in Ernest Becker, who wrote the book, speaks about the human desire to really deny that they'll die. But the truth is, everybody knows they'll die. What people really deny is evil. Because if you acknowledge evil, you have to fight it. And people are not brave. That's the human condition. And they don't want to fight it. They want to deny that it's really that bad. So I have seen this uh, all of, of my life, especially with with outside of Nazism, the great 20th century evil of communism. 100 million people, approximately, were killed by communist regimes, not in war. I'm not talking about deaths of soldiers. I'm talking about just innocent people, tortured, starved, burned, shot to death. That's, that's the record. See, that's an example, though, of people in a sort of denial. You should be shocked and horrified at what I just said. A hundred million people in, in one century? But it doesn't. Stalin, the Soviet tyrant, who, by the way, made, uh, made uh, North Korea possible, tragically. Stalin is truly evil. Anyway, Stalin, who killed about 20 to 40 million people of his own nation, Soviet Union, combination of Russia and, and other countries that the Russian Empire owned. He said, it's a very famous statement actually, one death is a tragedy, one million is a statistic. That uh, That's the state 
of people's understanding of evil. So when I said 100 million, people don't fall down and go, oh my God. It's, it, it's, too, it's too grandiose to even imagine. And remember, for every one of the 100 million, think of the ripple effect on family and friends and community. So we're talking about a billion people of staggering suffering that, uh, that communism caused. And yet, when I grew up, anti-communism had a bad name. Yeah? Oh, he's, a, he's an anti-communist zealot. What's wrong with that? I would hope you were an anti-Nazi zealot. <laughs> Why aren't you an anti-communist zealot? Now, there's one other aspect of evil that uh, should be noted, and then my guest, and that is human nature. I, I have talked about this all of my life. I've written about this. I know I have met a naive person if the person thinks people are basically good. And naivete in, in an adult is inexcusable. If a five-year-old thinks people are basically good, he's five years old, she's five years old. What do you expect? But if a 25-year-old or a 50-year-old thinks people are basically good, they're foolish. They're definitionally foolish. They may be kind and sweet and loving and love animals and all good things, but they're foolish. If you, any system built on the belief that human nature is basically good is going to produce bad. You can only make a good world if you start out with an understanding of your ingredients. And the ingredients of the human condition are not basically good. Of course there's good in people, otherwise there'd be no good in the world. But you have to battle your nature. The tragedy in America is that half of America thinks that the problems in their lives are caused by others. By America, by whites, by men, by their parents, not by themselves. I was with a group of recovering alcoholics, drug addicts, a couple of weeks ago. Terrific guys, all sober for between five and ten years. And I asked one of them in his late 20s, I said, so uh, tell me, when did you decide to become sober? I had no idea what he would say. And his answer was magnificent. The day I realized that I was the source of my problems, not others. That's the day he became sober. The left in America teaches you to blame others for your problems. One of the reasons it is so, so destructive. Therapists are destructive if they don't teach you that, yes, your parents may have done this and, and this, and your teachers may have done that and so on, but you are the biggest problem in your life. And until you know that, you can't make a good world. Okay, that's a long introduction to a remarkable woman, Yan Mi Park. By the way, she was from North Korea. A word on North Korea. North Korea is a gigantic concentration camp. And that is not an exaggeration. Everyone is in prison. Some are in worse prisons than others, but everyone is in prison. And it is the ultimate totalitarian state where you are told not just what you can say, but what you can think. But most people don't understand they hear, just like the, wor the word 100 million, people hear this and they don't realize how evil it is. Somebody who does, who grew up in North Korea, Yan Mi Park, is my guest. She escaped. We'll talk about her escape. It is almost impossible today to escape North Korea. It is virtually, it was never easy. And if you were caught, uh, you were tortured to death. And there's a good chance that your family was also tortured to death. Families were punished for the sins of others and still are in North Korea. 
So Yanmi, welcome to the Fireside Chat. Thank you for having me. So you know about the Fireside Chat, right? I do, because I've been watching this. <laughs> That's really wonderful. Yeah. I'm, I'm very touched. So meeting Otto must have been a thrill. Exactly. I feel like I know him. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know you too. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, you know me better than Otto. Wow. Uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm very touched that you, that mm. you do watch. Good. Mm. So uh, a little about you. Uh, you were born in what year? 1993. 1993, mm. and you were from a uh, a town in North Korea near the Chinese border. Yeah, it's called the Heisan Northern part of North Korea. Which is what made it even possible to even think about escaping. Yeah. Had you been in the center of, of North Korea, it would be impossible because you can't move around. Correct. You don't even know what escape means. That's not in your like vocabulary. So this is a North Korea does they get rid of the words like you know liberty love and escape so you, revolution we don't learn about revolution so we don't even know what that is and this is why it's so effective when you control the language because you remove so the really concept. there's no word for escape no so I did not even know that was a possible when I was younger I did not know and then just one day when you're so starving looking at China that's like well, maybe I have to go there but I did not know that was escaping. I only learned when I came to South Korea and America, they told me that was escape. I want to talk to you about the vocabulary issue mm -hmm. in, in a moment, but first a little more about your story. Mm -hmm. So at whose idea was it to leave North Korea? It was my idea, my sister's idea. Even though you had no word for escape? When to go there, find food. That's what oh, we said. Oh, you wanted to find food. We wanted to go there and then find food. So were you able to see China from your house? Yeah. Oh, that you were that close. Yeah, just one and, river across. And it looked much richer? We, I could literally someday smell it. Smell the, like, the ramen, like the smell. And then Chinese kids, right, in North Korea, we don't have the running water or laundry machines. We go to the river, we, we you know, wash our clothes, and we bathe in the river. So I, when I go to the river in the bay and wash my clothes, the Chinese side of kids come out, they are all wear fed and one the face. They ask me like, hey there, are you hungry? And I was like, shut up, you fat Chinese, I'm not hungry, right? Like I had a pride for my nation. And then I would lie, like we are not hungry. We have nothing to envy in this country. That's what the regime told That's me. That's right, of course. You were told, if I'm not mistaken, mm. that it's the greatest country in the world. Yeah, we had to sing the song called Nothing to Envy. Because we nothing have no to envy. Yeah, we had nothing to envy in this world. Can you sing a little of it? <laughs> I mean it. Yeah. Go like ahead. Like it's a hanirun purugo, like the the sky's blue, the our dear love loves us. Like I know we have not. He sang it like there's nothing to envy in this world. Nothing to envy. Yeah. Except for food, life, freedom, family, beauty, love. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, but otherwise, nothing to it. <laughs> That's I would change the words. Otherwise, I would put that in. Otherwise, nothing to end me. This is the first song you learn from your mother's birth. You die and you sing this song. It's it's it, it's very very difficult for most people to imagine. Yeah. I, I, I do. Uh, mm -hmm. I've studied it my whole life. I'm not bragging. I'm just mm -hmm. saying I know. I have a sense, a deep sense of what you're saying, of what mm -hmm. it is like to be there. So it was your idea, not your mother's idea? No. Uh, I mean, it was really just we thought we would be children. We could even go easily go there, maybe some begging some food and then come back. And we just had no idea what even escaping was dangerous. We just knew there was guards preventing us to go there, right? Yes. So a lot of things were not like it. So North Koreans do not have the ability to think critically. So when I was there, we made us, they made us to believe that Kim Jong-il was starving like us. They said, Kim Jong-il, dear leader, is starving. And I was crying on the New Year's Eve, like, please, dear leader, get some rest and eat food. And because I was worried about them, he is going to die from exhaustion. So when I went to South Korea, they were like, he's not starving. Look at him. He's a fat guy in the picture. He's the only fat one in North Korea. Mm. And, but in North Korea, you don't have the critical thinking ability, so you, I could not see. Even on TV, seeing him every day, I still believe that he was starving while he was being so fat. 
Oh, is that interesting? Yeah. He is the only fat man exactly. in, in North Korea. Absolutely. I never thought of that. Yeah. Although he's now lost 40 pounds. Did you know that? But still he's 200 pounds. And uh -huh. I'm like... <laughs> well, why did he lose so much weight? Do you have any idea? I recently heard it because he's so overweight that... Oh, he know, just did like, it. He went on a diet or whatever. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But that is such an interesting point. Yeah. Poor Kim is starving too. Yeah. So what if he's 100 pounds overweight? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, so how old were you when you had the idea of, hey, I, I got to get more food over the border? It was around 13, because that's when the situation got really, really hard on us, that we couldn't find really more food. And that's when I was like, at the last So did you say this to your mother? We did. And how did she react? I mean, she could not feed us. Right. right, so did so, she say, good idea, let's get out of here? No, she she was not going to leave. My sister and I were going to escape, the two of us. And mom so did and she my say to you, said, go ahead? She said, like, yeah, but just be careful. And Be careful, know, my yeah. God. <laughs> be it's, careful. Yeah. <laughs> this is not like a trip to Florida, you know, where there are alligators. But the thing is, like, in North Korea, death is so near. Like, every, you see dead bodies on the streets every day. Like, dying is not a big deal over there. Like... That's right. It's like here, I I, I, whenever I see people like somebody died as such a big funeral, like in North Korea, dying is almost like where somebody broke their leg, that kind of news. Okay, somebody died. And it's not a, like. Are there big funerals deal. in North Korea? If the family can, they do have. But a lot of deaths, we don't even know who they are. Uh, so most of them. And the they funerals, just died of starvation yeah, or so disease. Just, just on the street, floating. Dead bodies floating like around on the river, and we just don't even know who they are. It's, uh, yeah. So at 13, how old was your sister? 16 years old. And the two of you decide we, ha we have to go for food. Yeah. To Not something. we have to go for freedom. I mean, you don't know the word freedom. How do you fight? I mean, that's the thing. Like, we don't even know what that is. So we didn't fight I think that's freedom. a very, very important thing that, that, what, that people know that you, you didn't even hear the word. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you don't hear a word, you don't know it. No. People don't realize that. So that in, in, in 100 years ago in mm -hmm. parts of Africa, mm -hmm. if I would say, oh, it's where I come from, it snows. Mm -hmm. What is snow? So th this uh, notion of you never heard the word, mm -hmm. people don't realize the human being can only think about what they can think about. Yeah. So... It was not even in your mind, oh, we'll be free. Mm -hmm. By the way, which is somewhat of a joke, because China's not free. Yeah. But compared to North Korea, oh, there's no there's no comparison, yeah. I, I, clearly. Yeah. So your mother did not object. I find that fascinating. Because we were going to die. Because you, oh, okay. Anyway. <laughs> and did, and you, did you have a father? I did. Did you tell him? Yeah. And he said the same thing? Because be careful? Yeah. Just be careful. Be, so, so he, your parents faced this choice, mm -hmm. death by starvation, mm -hmm. death by being killed by a, a Korean guard. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Yeah. So yes, I would escape. So it's North Koreans, when they escape, it's not even like Syrians or Mexicans. We don't have a map. We don't have a phone. Like, we don't have a plan. Like, it's, imagine your house just caught a fire. You live in the apartment, like 10th floor. You caught a fire, right? You have no exit. What are you going to do? The last thing you can do is jumping out of the window and see if you make it or not. That's what we do. We just jump out of the window, and if we make it, we are lucky. If we die, I mean, we're going to die, burn to death anyway. Why do you bother? So that's the last choice we do is that. Right, exactly. That, that's why we risk our life for that. Correct. Mm -hmm. So what did you do, bribe a guard? I did not know. I didn't have Well, how did you to... get out? So... I was about to get out, but I got sick, and then they, my mom took me to hospital, and the doctor said I had appendicitis. They had to remove the appendix in that afternoon, and they removed it without any anesthesia, and that's why... Without anesthesia? Yeah. You were opened up without anesthesia? But that's very common. Like, they cut the bones without anesthesia, like... It's a very, it's normal practice. Do they, do, do they give you alcohol? I mean, what do they do to, I mean, but how could a human being be cut open and, and not go crazy? You do, you lose your mind, you, you faint. You, you're like conscious so vague, so you come back out of pain and you scream and then you pass out and 
But for me, like, I don't remember even, like, screaming, but my mom heard, like, I screamed, like, a, you know, dog that was getting killed by humans, that kind of sound. It's not even human so sound. So in, in North Korea, there's surgery, but no anesthesia. Yeah. I'm sure there's anesthesia for Communist Party officials. Oh, they do. Oh, they do. Yes. They have everything. They have everything. Yeah. Exactly right. The land of equality. Mm-hmm. So, okay, so you, you, you got better. I did. Have, I mean, I got out seven days later, but my sister couldn't wait because we were really running out of food. So she left while I was in the hospital. But when she left, she left a note under the pillow at house. So when I got out of the hospital, I found a note that my sister left saying, go find this lady at this address. And then as soon as I got out, I, I walked there with my mother in the morning and then knocked the door and asked her, we are looking for my sister. And initially she said, I don't know who your sister is. She was afraid that we were going to report her owner. So I was like, no, no, it's okay. I'm trying to go to China too. Can you help me too? And she said, yes. And she's like, you can go today. And then it's like, do you want to go? Why did this woman do it? For money? I don't know. I didn't ask. Do you, so you don't know even until today? Now you don't I know. know because she sold me. She sold you? Yeah. Oh, to Chinese? To, yeah, as a sex slave. As a sex slave. That's why she helped me. So she was making money from the Chinese. But the thing is, do you know, she had, uh, I think, if I don't remember, misremember, five children. She sold them all. She sold her own children. And then she later got executed. But if she Executed by the North Koreans? Regime. But the thing is, if she didn't sell me, I would not be here. There's one person that I need to be grateful for is the her. Right. I want to. I want. Yeah. I want to make that clear. Mm-hmm. Better to be a sex slave in China mm-hmm. than to die in North Korea. Absolutely. That I agree with you. By yeah. the way, I agree with you. Mm-hmm. Life is precious. Exactly. Yeah. So she did me a favor. Like I am grateful that she sold me. So she told How me. How did you know that she was executed? Later, uh, I still work in North Korea. I do rescue mission. I rescue North Korean defectors to freedom. So we have the guards I mean, network there. So following year, she got executed. But thank God she sold all her Did children. Did you know that you would be a sex slave in China? Of course, I did not even know what sex was. I did not have that vocabulary again. Oh, that's a good again. point. Right. So, right. Yeah. And ironically, you didn't know what a slave was because no. you already were a slave. Yeah. But did you know what China was? I didn't, I knew the name, but I did not know China was a big country or anything. What is the highway? I never even seen the highway. I never even seen the car, like with the AC, nothing like that. So I just saw the electricity lights. How old were you from. when you got out? 13 years old. And your sister was with you? No, sister left me four days before. I know, but I thought you caught up with her. No, I did not. I lost her for seven years. I caught up with her in South Korea. Seven years. Later, yeah. So you were completely alone in China? Initially, I was. I went to China with my mother, and then they sold us separately. So that's why you, I became alone. She was sold too? Yeah, she was Why sold didn't too. your father escape? Because this late, I mean, my father was a man. They cannot settle a man, right? You cannot oh, settle a man. Oh, th- this is no reason to help a man escape. No, only women. They did. Because of the one-child policy, there are 40 million men cannot find wives. They need a women. So you, you're sold as a sex slave, essentially to one man. No, there's a human trafficking ring in China. Right. So okay. Oh, I see. So this wasn't about finding a wife. This is finding a woman. No slave. Someone to yes, use. Yes. Right. Or yeah, it's not finding a, a slave, but it's yeah. not about finding a wife. No, Chinese regime does not recognize us as refugees, so we can never be a wife there. Oh, we are I we see. are fugitives. Oh we god. run around. Oh god. Yeah. So, did your father ever reconnect with the family? I did find him later. I found him. I found my mom eventually. But I, your father was still in North Korea. And then that's why I sent a person to North Korea and brought him to China through the brokers. You got him to to China through the help of whom? Brokers who rescue, who who sell these women, so through them. So there is a broker wing that getting these girls out and sell them in China. So I use the exact same network. Why wasn't your father killed by the regime? His whole family escaped. It, he was getting tortured, but then they wanted to keep him as a, a hostage to bring us and catch us. When your father escaped, was he in a camp? 
he or was, was he at home? home? He was home, but he was getting tortured and being beaten and constantly torturing all our family to look for us. And you met your father? Mm-hmm. I saw him again did, in China. Did the torture have an effect on his mind? Of course. He, he could not look at human eyes again. Because in prison, they teach them that you are not even an animal. So they teach you not to look at the guard's eyes. You're not, such a subhuman. You don't deserve to look at guard's eyes. So he's been so practiced in the prison that he cannot look into human eyes. When he got out, he never look at, looked at my eyes ever again. And he, he was singing songs like, I'm, I'm regretting that I was not a better revolutionary. My father wasn't like that, but he changed, he, they killed his soul forever. That they did, they killed his soul yeah. forever. Yeah. His, his so soul you, did, you really didn't, your father died, really. He died, yeah, when he got captured by the regime. His spirit died, but in China his body died. And even the last word was when you told me that, you know, People who, like in Cuba, getting educated, right? They are literate, but why is that socialism better? Like then, or my father was saying, even if in China you are sex slave, never try to escape to be free. Stay in China and do everything you can to stay here. Never take that exactly. Risk. I, I, That's what I, he said. Yes. Yeah. How long were you in China? Two years. From thirteen to, to 15? fifteen. Yeah. And, and, and then what? And then uh, some of this human trafficker who bombed me still had some humanity in him. He was a gambler. He, he got broke. And then he was letting me go. But then like, as a North Korean, where do you go in China? Right, yes. Like literally you have nowhere to go. Right. So we found another through North Korean defectors. There's a, so four places in North Korean women end up in China. One is this, like the sex slaves to North Korean and uh, Chinese farmers. Second is brothel, the prostitution, where you gave the 10 times a day. Third is where organ harvesting. China is a n number one organ like uh, exporter. So they kill us and take our organs out. The last place actually is a chat room where they put the girls in, inside the room and lock them down and they make them to chat and show their bodies to customers in South Korea. Among those four options, the best option I got was chat room. Of course. Where I don't get touched by men right. physically. So in that chat room, turns out those customers were South Koreans. Right. And and turns out South Korea is not starving and colonized by Americans. So in North Korea, they teach us that oh, South Korea... Oh, so you learned about South Korea in be, the chat room. being a naked chat woman. Yeah. What an irony. We're entering... <laughs> we're, we're, this is the definition of dystopia, the yeah. opposite of utopia. But this okay, is 21st century. Okay, so, so we're yeah. working on how you got out of China. So go so on. In the chat room, I found out that South Korea is a democracy and free. So, and then I heard there is a missionaries. And I was like, what the heck is a mission? I never heard that. I never even knew the word of religion. And there's like some religious people gonna help us if we become Christians. So I called the number, and then he said, okay, we're going to help you. Wait, you learned this in a chat room? Because there's one of North Korean defector women in the same chat room. She heard somewhere that missionaries rescue uh -huh. North Korean women. Okay. And she got the number, and she gave the number to me. So I called the person, and then he said, like, let's pray in the name of Jesus Christ. I was like, what is praying? I never heard such a word, pray. And then, like, okay, do you guys want to make this journey to freedom? And I was like, yes, we do. And they took us to the shelter in China, where we, like, study Bible for a month and memorize Psalms. Like, you know, we do fasting, and we really train to become Christians. And then once we prove our faith to them, that's when they told us, okay, if you want to escape from China, then you have to walk across the frozen Gobi Desert from China to Mongolia with a compass. We cannot take you because, I mean, that desert, chances of not making is like 99%. So they cannot guide us. They just take us to the border in China, give us a compass, so now walk across the desert. And if you are lucky, ending up in North Korea, that's in the name of God's grace. It's, at this point, it's not up to us. It's God got to show mercy 
and pray in the desert. He's gonna guide you. Why are, are the, these are South Korean Christians? Yeah, and why once you cross the border into Mongolia, could they not just fly you to South Korea? You don't have paper. We don't have passport. How do we? How do you get on the airplane? Wait, South yeah. Korea does not make it easy for a North Korean no, defector. They don't. This is a very important subject that people need to understand. Why mm -hmm. not? Because China is too powerful. China does not want North Koreans to escape from China. They all they want is to send us back to North Korea. China has the biggest uh, export trading with China, and their economy heavily relied on China. So they have to listen to Chinese. So South Korea is going to help you if you get out of China on your own. Right, but, but, so, of, but if you get to Mongolia, mm, why don't they help you once you're in Mongolia? That's when they helped us. So but you said you, that 99% of the people die. In, in the de in, because yes. of the crossing Mongolian desert, in the Gobi Desert, from China to Mongolia, nobody can come with us. In the, literally in the desert, there are like 16 wire fences. A lot of them all electrified fences. If you touch, you die. They're so highly electrified. And Who then, put they, those fences up? China? We don't know which gods, but it's a border. So I that's know. why so, they have to pull the wire so fences. So is it, is it to prevent Chinese from leaving or prevent Mongolians from going to China? I don't think anybody would dare to get into Gobi Desert. They, there's so many animals, too. They're going to eat you Oh, there. It's, a, it's a... Oh, my God. So... How long were you in the Gobi Desert? We were lucky only one day there because it was like minus 40 degrees in February in 2009. Who was we? We were in a team. Eight people with one toddler. So you cannot go in the desert on your own. It's very a lot of animals. You have to be a team to defend yourself if you ever get attacked by animals. Was it eight women? One man and seven women and one Wh What baby. nationality was the man? We're all North Koreans. We're all North Korean defectors. Was he Christian? We all were Christian. Oh, you we were all Christian all trained by then. There. Yeah. Did you really believe in Christianity Absolutely. or you did it to escape? No, you do. Later, I did not become one after a while because, but then it's like thing. I was so desperate, right? No, it's, no, I, I'm just asking. I'm so not, I, I don't, don't think, I, I think it was the right decision. But the thing <laughs> is, I don't think even I had the energy to fake it because I was so desperate. Like, of if course. Asked me, they asked me to believe in a rock, I would have believed in a rock. Correct. Because anything they would say to me, I would have believed in. That's right. And so I don't think I didn't even have to fake it. I really truly believed. Anything rescues me, I'm going to believe that. I'm going to pray for that. Mm -hmm. Well, by the way, just comment. I would say many American university students believe in rocks. Oh, really? So, <laughs> what did so they do? We, so your point is very well taken. Really? Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm only, I'm only slightly exaggerating. Okay. <laughs> uh, so... What happened after a day in Mongolia? We got caught by Mongolian soldiers. And then? And then they said they were going to send us back to China and back to North Korea. The Mongolians said yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. So they put the knives, like, put but your hands they, up. But they knew if they sent you back to North Korea, you'd be killed. And so, yeah, we, And they didn't care? They did not care. So, Beautiful world. Exactly. Right. So what happened? So when North Koreans escaped, it's during the Holocaust, right? The Jewish people would like try to kill themselves before sent to gas chamber. Right. So like that, we have the poisons, we have the knives with us. So we were all trying to kill ourselves in front of the Mongolian soldiers. The last minute, they stopped us. And then, but with the team that came after us, they went too far. So one of the lady that we knew, she swallowed the poison. But later we learned these guys had no intention to send us back. They just wanted to have fun with us, to so, see. So they were sadists. Yeah, to have fun. So the, it was fun to watch you suffer and try to kill yourself. Yeah. Okay. Well, it certainly does substantiate my earlier point about human nature. So still, I how did you get out? After that, all that thing we were trying to kill ourselves, they they eventually stopped our game and then took us to Mongolian base, soldier base, and then they called the South Korean embassy. South Korean embassy came, and then they got our information and make sure that we are North Koreans. They did the interrogation on us. After two, three months in the detention center in Ulaanbaatar, they took us to South Korea. 
So they did help you in some way, South Korea. Yeah, in Mongolia they did, not in China. Once we made it to Mongolia, right. that's when they helped. Did you make friends with any of these other seven women? I did, yeah. But the thing is, North Koreans, we learn not to trust very That's right, young. that's so true. So it's, like it's hard to be so with you, your you, friends. You, um, among mm. the, the, the many things you didn't know was the word friend. Mm. We have a comrade. Comrade, yeah, comrade, which has nothing yeah. to do with friend. Yeah, so we are... Yeah, if com it was even Comrade Kim. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Like Comrade Stalin. Yeah. So you were flown to Seoul or mm. somewhere else? Incheon Airport from Mongolia Inchon? to Incheon Airport. Yeah. yeah. And 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 you you then what? Because you have no money, you have no relatives, you have no contacts. But not only that, they had to take us to hospital first because in our entire life we have never been medically examined. So we could have bring disease to South Korean population. So we had to be sealed from South Korean population first. Plus, you, they take you out of the airport. It's like they using the separate gate, take us to hospital, and then ask me to pee. I'm like, I never peed in the cup. Like, why do I have to pee? They check your health status and if you carry any, any disease. And then once I'm cleared, then they put me in the interrogation center for two months. That's when they really going down to you. Are you a spy? Are you actually the person that you, who you are saying? And they like, why don't you uh, recite the, the revolutionary, the oath that every North Korean must remember? Like, that if you're North Korean, you all know these things, right? You remember by heart. So we recite all of them, who are our teachers, where we live, to our school, we have to draw a map for them. After this vigorous integration, then that's like, okay, if you're proven not spy, you can go into re-education. It's a like kind of camp where they take us there and then teach us that Americans are not bastards. Americans are not colonizing South Korea. The Korean War started by Kim Il-sung, not by Americans. And tell us that what democracy is. And also tell us how to take a bus. I mean, we are like coming from different planet. We don't even know what coffee is. We don't even know, you know, what anything, like what AC is, right? So we really like big adult kids, like toddlers, have no clue about the world. They teach us, you know, what, how to, what is a bank? Because we don't know what bank is. What is, you know, shopping mall? What is a supermarket? Literally going from every single subject and teach us there. Okay, what happens <laughs> next? After that three months, they send you out to the world. And then that's where you figure out your life. So we... And that's a challenge, isn't it? Of course it's challenging. Because you never were free yeah. But freedom comes with responsibility. It does. Now you have to work and you have to make a living and you have to think right. for yourself. And was, that, was, that, was that uncomfortable? It was painful. It wasn't just uncomfortable. It was painful. I literally was, uh, I never like, knew how to think, right? I mean, learned thinking was hard. So I, every time in South Korea in the beginning, I think for five minutes. I get so exhausted from thinking. I like have to take a break for five hours. And the next day, I don't go, I'm okay, today I'm going to think 10 more minutes. I literally had to do that. Thinking, so they were saying, now nah, what do you want to do in South Korea? I'm like, do I have to know? Why well, can't you just tell me what to do? In North Korea, when you're born, your life was determined for you before your birth, based on my, what my great-grandfather did. And in South Korea, suddenly they say, what's your favorite color? And I'm like, do I have to know? Because in North Korea, nobody asks you, what do you think? They tell you your favorite color is like red. It's a revolutionary color. And South Korea, learning how, what, think, thinking for myself, that was very so exhausting. So did you have an apartment? We got this uh, government housing for the first year or six months. But I rented a small like underground studio. What work house. did you do? I worked in a dollar store called Daiso. It's a dollar store. I was working at the wedding, like the serving server, like a wedding, you know, waitress, and those kind. And I was studying too, so I was studying and working at the same time. How do South Koreans treat North Koreans? <sighs> they have a, a lot of stereotypes of North Korean people. 
So if, uh -huh. they say, oh, because you're from communist country, you must not work hard. And you must not understand. Well, were they wrong? Because you're saying we weren't taught to take care of ourselves. Yeah. But you did work hard because you had to, you, so you had to find food. Exactly. You worked, for, you worked as a slave, but you didn't have to think. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, or what are the stereotypes? That, I mean, that like uh, they, they don't understand the culture. Like they don't know the way of the Western mind thinking that they have, especially with the men, right? North Korean men don't know what, like how to treat women. They, every day women get beaten by men in North Korea, like their husbands. And when they go to South Korea, they don't even know what consent is. So a lot of, a lot harder for men to adjust than women. And the accent is a bit more like aggressive. The North, I mean, we don't know the words, right? Like friends. And we don't know so many things. So South Koreans does look down on us like a second citizens, that we are like um, not a full human for them. Did, did, a, did a South Korean man want to date you, take you for coffee or? Yeah, South Korean men actually uh, like North Korean women in because North Korean women are traditional. The South Korean women don't want to have kids. They don't want to even get married. But North Korean women still think having children and having family is important. So actually women have much better time in South Korea because South Korean men, they're conservative men, well North Korean women, but then North Korean men are too rough for South Korean women. And so North Korean women also want the South Korean man who is very gentle and nice. And, makes, no and makes a living. Yeah, so it's, as a North Korean man in South Korea, very hard to find a partner. It's, uh, it's really hard for them. How many North Koreans have made it to South Korea? South Korea is a lot, 30, over 30,000. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a lot and not a lot. They have, yeah, it's it, 75 it, years. This is, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. in 75 years. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you are now how old? What, about 17? I am 27. <laughs> no, 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 at this point By then in this story. I was no, I was still 15 or 16. South Korean age was 17. Yeah, was 17. Like, yeah, so, right. Like, so, you're yeah. 17 mm -hmm. alone. Did you make any friends? I tried. And then, as soon as they found out that I was North Korean, they literally called me in the middle of the night. Like, why are you a spy? Why are you friends with me? So, it, the, just the discrimination was impossible. Really? Yeah. So, what about, what about a man friend? I mean, they was were that, fine. Was that, was that possible? They were fine, but by then I was so traumatized by men in China. I would think so. I would never like date anybody. I would not like have any, any romantic. I, 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 yeah. I'm surprised that that didn't remain a permanent part of your life. Thank God it didn't. Exactly. It took some time. It took. I wouldn't say that it took a one day, right? But I think it took a. But I remembering, my father was a man who was my hero. Like he was the most selfless person I've ever met. I think when you're in the safe place, you can have perspective, right? And you don't have to thinking for your survivor. So when I was being in America, being safe, and thinking about all the good men that I met in my in journey, that really helped. Okay, so how did you get from South Korea to America? So I had a speech that I gave in Ireland, Dublin. Uh, where is international conference? I gave my first speech there. Why did they invite you? They so this is called the One Young World Conference. They bring all the world young leaders from all around the world, and they ask North Korea to send their delegation because it's like your youth Olympic for the youth leaders. And North Korea says we can only send three. It's like they like why? Because they have to spy on each other. So if it's a three of us here, I spy on you. You spy on Megan, Megan spies on me. So if I'm being so nice, I'm not going to report on you, but I know that I'm being watched by her. But then you're also watching her. So we are being spied, you're spying. So they say, at least you got to send three to spy on each other. So they said, okay, then why don't we sponsor two people and you sponsor one person to come to this conference that world are joining? And they said, no. And that's like, okay, then we are going to find North Korean defectors. And that's how they found me. Because North Were Korea. Were you officially a North Korean delegate? There I was. So I was Were, in North were you? Yeah. Be North Korea would not accept you. 
No, no. So, so I would not represent the North Korean. Uh -huh, you regime. weren't, but you I were a North Korean people. young person yes. there. Yeah. So you gave a speech in Ireland. Yeah. And that was that what, in what the, language? In English. Where did you learn English? I taught myself. Well, your English is superb. <laughs> Thank you, you. You you taught yourself in South Korea. Mm -hmm. You're an exceptional human being. Oh, this is, okay. No, 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 no. It, 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 it's not even a compliment. It's just a fact. <laughs> so, okay. So, you gave the speech in Ireland, and then what? That was <clears throat> viewed by like almost a billion people. That broke the internet. So that's when the Penguin Random House called me. I was like, we're calling from Penguin Random House. Like, why is it called? Penguin, like the bird calling me, right? I have no idea what Penguin Random House is. And they want to write a book. So my publisher was in New York, an agent was in New York. That brought me to America to write a book. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> From um, North Korea to America. Yeah. I was 21 by then, so. And then you stayed. And then I, and then I joined the Columbia University. So that's how I stayed even longer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which brings us to the very, very serious topic of your what you were studying at Columbia. Yeah. So you enrolled in Columbia University, mm -hmm. and I should let you say it, but I'll just let you comment on it. Is it fair to say that to your shock, you spent the next few years hearing how bad America is? Yeah, not only that, they are the source of every problem that humanity got. The only way for us to be better and get rid of our problem is getting rid of America. Not just bad, that they are teaching us that only reason, only way we can move forward from all our problems like systemic, systemic oppression, racism, and you know, those xenophobia, homophobia, all of that, is because of white men and American imperialism. Only way to solve that is tearing down U.S. Constitution, get rid of this country, tearing down this country. So that was every single class in the four years I learned at Columbia. For that alone, it was really significant to, to have you on this fireside chat. I return to the word shock. Mm -hmm. You know evil you know the good America has done, mm -hmm. and then you come to an American university to hear that America is evil. Yeah. So you, you must have thought, this is another planet. Yeah. Planet A, <sighs> North Korea. Planet B, South Korea. Planet C, America. Yeah. Or at least an American university. Mm -hmm. Did you ever speak up in class? and? Uh, I'm not saying you should have, but I did have you, tried many you, times. You, and say, I don't know what you're talking about. You, you people don't know what you're talking about. So, so, for instance, like my professor said, do you know, like when men holding a door for you, what does that mean to you? It's like, oh, decency, being a gentleman. Like, no, this is where you need to be walk about. You need to look at the hidden oppression by the men that by the holding a door for women, they are overpowering you. They're showing off their power. And this is a max to I mean, maxic what wait, masculinity wait, toxic what, masculinity. Wait, what subject was the class? This is also more about social study. One of the core requirements that we take about the global. And this core. was a man who said this. It's a woman. Uh huh. But this I is another. So. But this is another man class. I'm gonna give you an example. The, he was actually a Jewish uh, professor about Western civilization and music. We all have to take that art and music, right? And then be, before even class, he says, so who has a problem calling this course Western Civilization Music? And everybody raised their hands like, I did not. And then there's like, do you know, because of these bigots that white men silence so many women and the people of color, then now we have to study this uh, unbelievable Mozart and Beethoven, this like a white supremacist. And it's unbelievable Colombia is requiring this class as a mandatory course for you guys to study. I cannot believe this word. And this is a professor who is Jewish, by the way. So, so not, not that I'm against him, but the thing is... Oh, I have a lot against yeah, him. So I'm Jewish I, I, and I, I'm embarrassed. So I hold a hand and I ask him, like, so, after all, we are in the West. 
and in Korea, we learn Korean missions, American missions. So we are trying to be open-minded, global-minded. What's wrong with studying Western artists that had a lot of influence in our like course of music in you know history? Like no, that's because you're brainwashed. And every single time I speak up, they say I'm brainwashed. Oh. And that's like okay. They By the way, for the record, Korea, South Korea, is one of the the the, the biggest cultural centers for classical music. Yeah. The Seoul Symphony mm -hmm. Orchestra is one of the great orchestras of the world, mm -hmm. and they're playing Beethoven. Exactly. <laughs> and not because Koreans believe in white supremacy. No. They believe in the supremacy of excellence. Absolutely. I mean, I never thought, I mean, studying Beethoven, listening to Mozart was a sign of white supremacy. I just never thought that was it. No, no, no. You, you have to go to Colombia, where, where <laughs> I went. I, 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 it's gotten worse, but it was the same nonsense. Mm -hmm. It's worse than nonsense. The same horrible, destructive ideas. Mm -hmm. and, and most of your fellow students agreed, right? They, they bought most, this. All of them. All, all, of, them. all of them raised their hand, except other than me. Uh, other than you. They, and then, like, you know, in my orientation, before going to classes, it's like, so who loves to read Jane Austen? It's like me, right? Until in North Korea, I didn't even know what love was. So for me, reading something that was written before Kim was like unbelievable. There was a history before Kim existed. And there's a book about love back even old days that people talking about love. And the, do you know, this is how you look for hidden oppression again, hidden, you know, the agenda from white men. Because Jane Austen was alive during the white colloquialism, during the white supremacy. Therefore, by reading her work, you are being brainwashed by white men, white people. So this is how you be walk. Look for the hidden infiltration of our enemies. And it's literally, that's what North Korea says in the classroom. Enemies are behind the trees. Enemies are under the ground. They are infiltrated everywhere. Well, we have you, to look you for have it. basically said that you heard more anti-American propaganda at Colombia than in North Korea. Almost say. <laughs> I think almost. In oh. North Korea, everything is about America, right? Everything right. horrible. And in Colombia, exactly the same thing. Everything is like a problem with America and white men. Do you have a theory, and, 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 and you may not, it's not an easy question. Mm. Do you have a theory as to why there's so much America hatred in America? I don't. Why? Right. Well, it's very... It's a very difficult question. How do you grow up in the freest country in the world and hate it? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it? There's no purely rational answer, actually. And I've mm -hmm. studied this question my whole life. But you and I have spoken once before, or twice before, on the radio mm -hmm. and in person, and we both independently mm -hmm. came to realize that these are all substitute religions, yeah. mm -hmm. which is my, my that, that I do believe, that they're sort of empty souls that need something to believe in, and anti-Americanism <sighs> has become their religion. They don't they don't believe in freedom, they don't believe in God, they don't believe in Christianity, they don't believe in Judeo-Christian values. Everything is gone, so, but you have to believe in something or you kill yourself. Right. So, America represents everything they hate. Capitalism, liberty, mm. religion, assimilation of peoples, they, they, they they hate all of that, mm -hmm. and it's still it's still un, it's still hard to understand. Yeah. So, let's take the video question because it leads mm. exactly uh, to what uh, what I want you to comment on. So, if you can't if you can't hear it, I'll repeat it mm. for you. Hi, my name is Jacob. I'm 17 years old, and I'm from Greenville, South Carolina. As a refugee from North Korea, you know what true oppression is. What frustrates you most about the American left's idea of oppression? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> it is. I, I, I thought you'd like it. No. I mean, this is a funny thing. So at Columbia, we did these people 
spending hundreds of grand to go there, right? Why they can afford to be a vegan. The how they are talking about they are vegan and you know, fighting for animals and like eco-friendly products. And they talk about how they're oppressed. And I'm like, do you guys know that people who are actually oppressed don't even know that they are oppressed? If you know you're oppressed, you're really not oppressed. <laughs> and that's what they don't get here. Like, you know, people in North Korea, they don't even know they're oppressed. And here, they don't even know the definition of oppression and using this word oppression on every single thing. Like, man holding a door is oppression. I mean, like, reading Jane Austen is oppression. I mean, like, not having your own bathroom for your specific, like, pronoun is oppression. Like, every single thing is oppression. It's like some became a game for them. That's exactly right. It is a game for them. Yeah. It became some competition. Who can find more oppression? That's what it is. Who can tighten more oppression? It's almost like that prize right. you look for. Where can we find another oppression? It's a entire class we spend that what they call critical thinking is looking for that oppression. So you come to America and you see what's going on. Is it depressing? Beyond depressing. I mean... After North Korea, like, I lost my faith in humanity. Like, I have so seen the worst of humanity. I lost it all. And when I came to America, I found that love, that I started believing people again. I believed that world was good again. And going to Colombia, I can know these, these idiots, I mean, whatever you call it, useful idiots, the idiots these, is fine. these idiots can literally take us to a country like North Korea. That's right. They can be, make us like China. And because of them, now I'm worrying about my son. Like, I thought best thing I gave to him was giving him the free country mm -hmm. where he doesn't have to worry about oppression. Now, I'm not sure. Like, I'm fighting for my freedom of speech right now in America. How he's going to be free here, right? I'm really Because worried. this is the, the point. The issue is not Korea. The issue is the left. Yeah. The left ruined half of Korea. Mm -hmm. The left will ruin America. The left ruins everything it touches. Absolutely. There is no exception in the history of the left. Yeah. It's pure, it's like a shark. Mm -hmm. It just eats everything that it sees. Yeah. It devours everything. Mm -hmm. It is a sick part of the human condition. By the way, uh, you said you lost your faith in humanity. Yeah. F for your interest, I never had faith in humanity. I still don't. I have faith mm. in a handful of humans. Humanity stinks. Mm. Some humans are terrific. Part of the reason is that there were two, uh, two big reasons I, I believe that. Mm -hmm. Maybe, well, three actually. One is I know history. <laughs> two is I'm a Jew. Mm. And I know that the, uh, the human condition uh, is Auschwitz and, yeah. and death camps and torture and genocide. That's a big part of the human condition, and not just for Jews, mm -hmm. but especially. Mm -hmm. And third, uh, I, uh, I, I know the Bible. The Bi I knew at the age of five that people are not basically good. It is one of the fundamental teachings of the Bible. Yeah. Secular people are much more naive than truly religious people. Interesting. Wow. And na naive is bad. It is bad. Really bad, because yeah. then then you deny what the problems of humanity. So I just want to say for the record, mm -hmm. I have zero faith in humanity. That's why when I hear about, uh, uh, what is it, uh, world opinion? Mm -hmm. What did world opinion do for the Jews in the Holocaust? What did world opinion do for the North Koreans? What did world opinion do for the Armenians? What did world opinion do for the Ukrainians? What did world opinion do for the Tutsis? <laughs> it's, uh, what are you, these people who even talk about it, they should be embarrassed. Yeah. World opinion isn't worth spit. Yeah. No. They they don't care. Like that. They don't care. They don't That's care. exactly they right. They don't care. They don't. Did they care about you in Colombia? No. They thought you were a cuckoo. Yeah. <laughs> Some brainwashed person. Because the, the one, the only one who knew oppression, mm -hmm. and they're telling you they're oppressed. You you must have gone. I don't know how you, you didn't go a little crazy. I Maybe, did. Yeah, you did. Well, by the way, for the record, uh -huh. I went a little crazy at Columbia. Too. Oh really? I swear to God. Oh my God. I remember as as if it were yesterday. One day, mm -hmm. it, I was walking around Columbia, mm -hmm. and I thought I'm totally alone. Yeah. I don't think like anyone else at this whole university. Right. Yeah, I literally thought 
maybe I'm a bigot. Like literally oh. at the end of it. <laughs> You're maybe, a bigot. Yeah, I was like, maybe yes. I am. Well, like, you are. You're bigoted <laughs> against stupidity, right, so which like, immediately uh, rendered uh, Colombia problematic. It was like I I couldn't believe why they say like the skin color matters. Like no, it doesn't matter. That's right. I mean like from North Korea going to South Korea, they say yeah because your birthplace you are being discriminated. Coming to America, I was like it doesn't matter you're from North Korea. Who cares? So now what do you wanna do in the world, right? Like who are you? But now in Colombia, like what pronoun are you? It's all about how do you identify yourself. That's right. And it's like. I'm sorry, I forgot to open up the interview with asking your pronouns. <laughs> I, I, I blew it. I did blow it. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm curious. Uh, I asked you about Christianity. Mm. Are, are you at all religious today? Yeah. Which religion? It's a hard Or to no define. religion, just no, God-centered. I, God, I think reading Jordan Peterson last year, it brought me to God. And... Reading you now, I, it brought me to God. I was uh, listening to Prager U video actually about why do you need to expose children to church? You at least give them the chance. And I was like talking to my ex-husband like, thank you for taking him to church. That mm -hmm. I do send my son to church. It's what shocked me coming to America is that chaos and morality. Even in North Korea, like they tell you what is good and bad. Like if children misbehave, if we don't bow or properly or something, they said this is not good. What shocking in America was like everything is okay because you are freedom, and then that's why like people on the street that inject yourself with drugs because you are free, you can do it, you can kill yourself by drinking drug and drink it to your death. Right, and it's the anarchy that I see. Correct. Here. America is built on the belief that you don't have to listen, that the, the state won't control mm -hmm. you but you must control your you. consciousness, your virtue and yeah. eventual, and that you are ultimately uh, obligated to do what God wants yeah. you to do. No God, you get anarchy in a mm -hmm. free country. Nah, that's what we got. I that, saw that. And I'm like getting. walking at the New York and Chicago with the needles and I'm like, right. this is not freedom. Correct. This is irresponsibility. Oh, that, right. It is like you're being such a selfish person. And it's like, I don't want my son to think that's freedom. Correct. Freedom comes with the responsibility and they don't people. That, that, that's right. And Boy, you, you understand America better than most Americans. How ironic is that? How ironic. <laughs> I had to talk about freedom. For someone who did not even know what the word free was until adult. It is also, it's also amazing that you have the ability to be happy. How can you not be? I'm like <laughs> that's a great answer actually yeah I I've all I you know I, I've written a book on happiness I talk mm -hmm. a lot about it that is my view what is your choice yeah why would you, it's a choice happiness mm -hmm. you make the decision you make a decision I'm gonna be happy that's the thing that it's not like if someone make you fear you make the choice that's right and like they say about like if you change your mood for 90 seconds right Think about that's like how much control we have. Instead, like make the government to make this me happy. Is a, this is a woman whose father was tortured, basically, to death. Who was a sex slave at thirteen, and is telling you you have to choose to be happy. And most people watching this have not had your background, <laughs> and don't choose to be happy. Hmm. The left in America teaches you not to be happy. Yeah. That's the amazing thing. Mm -hmm. By the way, that's a big part of the answer to about the left. Mm -hmm. They're not happy. The unhappy hate the happy. Yeah. They and, and the unhealthy hate the healthy. Yeah. And the anti-religious hate the religious. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it's, that's a big, a big part of it. That is true. Like they almost asked me, like as something like if I have a problem, like why are you not bitter? Why don't you hate men? Like why don't you hate people? Why are you smiling? I'm like what? <laughs> it's almost in, in the West. There's expectation. If you go through something horrible, you gotta be complaining and bitter. 
that was some kind of like certain you're, condition right. that you have to you're be so in. You're so right. And I'm but like, it's worse than that. <laughs> Even if you don't go through terrible things, yeah. you're supposed to be bitter. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, you're supposed to be anti-male because they hold the door open. Yeah. <laughs> or because they said at work, you're cute. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. Exactly. And so. Well, your proof, your <laughs> living proof of my whole theory of my life. I've always said, I have contempt for humanity and I love humans. Mm -hmm. You're one of the humans of whom that is true. Thank you. you. But you know, you say thank you, which is very sweet, and I understand why you're saying thank you. But the truth is, you, you have worked on this and you get credit for it, but you also have that nature. You mm -hmm. have been given a gift either by God or by, by luck, mm -hmm. and I don't know which. Even though I believe in God, I, I, I don't know. But you were given a nature that could choose to be happy mm. if you made that choice. Given what you have gone through, you can easily be on antidepressant drugs. And everyone would understand that. Your antidepressant is your nature and your wisdom. Thank you. But that, that's a fact. What helps me is watching Prager your videos. I mean, it's not I'm trying to be nice that truth really liberates people. When I found the truth, it really, truth was simple. It wasn't comfy. It was all about me. It was up to me to make that decision. That's right. And instead of like thinking, you know, blaming people, that what you do, that educating people, telling people the truth, it really, really matters. And I binge watch your video, like 20 of them in the same day. <laughs> so thank you for everything you do to help all of us. Well, if you're thanking me for what we do, I take it as a big deal. <laughs> this was among the great hours of my life. Oh, thank you. And I've had a lot of great hours. We, I have a feeling we will be together again. Yeah. Let's do this on the college campuses. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> that would be able to go crazy. What would they call me? I'm not even white. <laughs> yeah. What will they call you? Grateful. Oh. The best thing there is. I'm Dennis Prager. This is Young Me Park. And thank you for watching. Thank you for watching this video. To keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax deductible donation.